Hi, I'm Craig McNamara, and I serve as president of Sierra Orchards, which is our family farming operation, and I'm also president of the California State Board of Food and Agriculture. My name is Maddie Diamato. I founded Love Grown Foods. We're an all-natural health food company based in Denver, Colorado. We are huge on getting access to healthier foods to our kids, and so we're going to schools educating kids on the importance of eating breakfast, what whole grains are, why you should be able to pronounce every ingredient in your food. We're also working with school districts to get them access to healthier foods to serve in their cafeterias. And lastly, we're working on building community awareness around this issue and how we can, as a community, help be part of the solution. Hi, my name is Reese Powell, and I'm the president of Red Rabbit LLC. We started in 2005 and our mission is to provide healthy food for all kids. Presidio Presents. Um, it, this has been a really fun series for us starting back in the fall. My name is William Shutkin and I'm the president and CEO of the Presidio Graduate School, which is really the world's leading uh, and one of the first pure sustainability graduate programs in the world, offering MBA, MPA, Master of Public Administration, dual MBA, MPA, and uh, continuing ed, executive ed, in sustainable management. Uh, we invite you to find out more about us, those of you who aren't students or currently enrolled or alum, uh, at presidiograduateschool.org. Uh, we've got a wonderful cast of staff around who are here to answer questions. We have about 525 alumni, many of whom are in the Bay Area, uh, and 220 students currently enrolled. The Hub, one of our partners, of, uh, to whom we are most grateful, serves as a venue for many of our community events like, uh, like tonight's. So we're delighted to have you. I'm gonna say a couple of remarks about the series, uh, maybe a couple of more things about the school, quickly introduce our panelists and then get on with the program. We're gonna try to wrap up with panel-based discussion around 8.15 uh, to leave about 15 minutes worth of questions. We'll then hang out for a little bit as we've done in the prior sessions uh, uh, for folks to meet with the panels directly, uh, who I know will be delighted to, uh, to see you. Um, first of all, the series. I want to thank our series uh, funder, Dan Leftwich of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Dan is a social investor, an entrepreneur, a former uh, class action plaintiff side antitrust litigator say that 10 times fast, um, uh, who over the last several years, in addition to becoming a blessing giver, uh, decided that sustainability was the path he wanted to be on. Uh, and so is investing uh, both as a, uh, a venture uh, investor and as a philanthropist in programs like this uh, to expose more and more people uh, to amazing ideas and to amazing entrepreneurs and leaders uh, like the ones we have tonight. I want to thank our staff as always, uh, and in particular Andy Sexton who organizes our events um, for, uh, for making them happen, the hub again, um, any sponsors who have been delivering the goods like the Green Casket, or Andy, what's the name of the company? Green Barrel. Sorry. Close. Close, although it's, it's not a mortuary. It's a, it's a wine-based business. Um, anyway. Yeah, exactly. It's it made out of recycled caskets, for, for all I know. Uh, but, so we're so delighted that, uh, that they're with us. Um, and again, check out our staff. Uh, COO, Director of Admissions, Communications Manager, everybody's here. Our uh, Alumni Affairs Director, Sonia. Kendall. Note too that Presidio has its first ever uh, fundraising campaign called Propel Presidio. So for those of you interested in our school as, uh, as donors and contributors, please check out our website at Propel Presidio and you can find out more about our campaign uh, as we look to a growth phase and a growth capital phase for our now eight-year-old uh, uh, best-in-class program. Um, let's see. One more Presidio Presents event to close out the year, the end of April. I believe it's April 26th, and we will be featuring entrepreneurs in venture capital in the clean tech space, uh, and we'll have a remarkable panel. You can find out more, uh, again, on our website, uh, or by contacting Andy Sexton, our events and special programs manager. 
Um, anything else that I, I might have left out? I think that's about it. So delighted you all came out tonight. Uh, for our school, we're just coming off of midterms. There's a competing event upstairs. There's always too much going on in the city. Uh, but remarkably, we've been able to fill uh, all of the seats at each of these events, even with our nominal fee. Uh, so thanks to all of our students, alum, partners, and the public for coming out and learning more about our school and about these great ideas. So I wanted to start tonight's event, which is focusing on food and ag and sustainability, with a, uh, uh, an, exact, an excerpt from a blog post from this morning's New York Times from Mark Bittman who's now the sort of full-time food writer for the Times. Uh, let me also say that at this year's uh, uh, commencement, if he's in town, uh, we will be awarding an honorary degree to Michael Pollan. If he's not in town, that will happen next fall. But for the first time ever, the Presidio Graduate School is awarding honorary degrees uh, to our two commencement speakers, uh, Michael Pollan being one, and Howard Dean, the former governor of Vermont, and no stranger to ag, uh, number two. So I wanted to mention Pollen because Bittman and Pollen are two of our great writers uh, and exponents for uh, new ways of thinking about food. And Bittman wrote just this very morning on Ag Day in California. Today is Ag Day, coincidentally. We have nothing to do with the, the planning. Bittman writes, ultimately the calorie is political. Marketing affects instinct. And Nestle and Nesheim, this is the book he's reviewing, really shine in their analysis in this realm, Mary and Nestle. Their slogan, get organized, eat less, eat better, move more, get political, remember pollen, eat vegetables, not too much, something or other. When I asked Nestle what she would do, given that people in the United States were obviously eating too many calories and that the resulting excess weight was costing all of us life years and money, she answered quickly, we need a farm bill that des that's designed from top to bottom to support healthier diets, one that supports growing fruits and vegetables and making them cheaper. We need to fix school lunches so they're based on fresh foods and fix food assistance programs so people have greater access to healthier foods. Her list goes on. Even if a calorie is a calorie, the situation is not so simple. And what we have tonight on this panel are people who are providing solutions, strategies to address the very kinds of challenges, complex challenges that Bittman is, is writing about. So let me quickly introduce, starting from the audience's left, Craig McNamara, uh, who I just learned tonight, or perhaps a few weeks ago, from one of our co-founders, Dick Gray, has been associated with this school and any predecessors. World College West. World College West for, for many, many years. Uh, Craig left Stanford some time ago, uh, learned about food and ag, went to UC Davis to become truly an expert. Um, and has been running one of the leading organic uh, walnut farms uh, in the state, if not the country, well, therefore the country, uh, for a few years, called Sierra Orchards. He's also the founder of an amazing organization called the Center for Land-Based Learning, and one of our uh, alum, Chris Yolanda, serves on that board, uh, educating the next generation of uh, farmers, agriculturalists, and food advocates. Craig will tell us more about that. To Craig's left, is Maddie D'Amato, um, not the senior member of this panel, uh, who at the ripe age of 24 has gone on to found a company whose wares are right there on that table for your pickings called Love Grown Foods. Maddie's the co-founder and the chief love officer of Love Grown Foods, a Denver, Colorado-based healthy snack company that will soon be branching out from granola to all things tasty and, and healthful. Uh, so Maddie is here with us tonight from Denver. And then finally, to Maddie's left, Reese Powell, uh, an MIT-trained entrepreneur who decided to, to get real about changing the food system that our kids are exposed to in schools. And so founded Red Rabbit, a venture-backed company that both cooks, manufactures, and distributes healthy food, currently in New York City public schools, but soon New Jersey as well. So quickly scaling uh, a, a very uh, exciting enterprise. So with that, delighted to have this panel. Thanks you guys for being here tonight and can't wait to engage. So let's do that. Can you tell folks a little bit about how you got the idea for a company uh, and how you actually set about creating it and now making it happen? And why don't you note sort of where you can find your product to the extent that it's, it's now available just a few years after startup? 
So the entire idea behind Love Grown Foods, I give so much credit to my co-founder and partner and boyfriend, Alex, because he was the crazy one who had the idea that we should go into the food business. My background and passion is in health and wellness. My background is in Pilates, massage therapy, and nutritional consulting, and I love to cook. And so we joined forces, and when Alex saw an opportunity to share my cooking with the world, Love Grown Foods was born, and it originally started with pesto, and we quickly realized perishability was a huge factor and moved to granola, which is far from that. And over the course of the past two and a half years, we've gone from being on the shelves of one store in the mountains of Colorado to being on the shelves of 2,300 stores across the country, including distribution to the two largest retailers in Canada, and are growing rapidly. And I think that to us, it's not just putting a healthier product on the shelves, it's how can we give back to the community? And we have a huge passion for exactly like this gentleman next to me, of working with schools and getting kids educated on healthy eating and how important starting your day off with a healthy breakfast is to your learning and to how you're going to perform, perform in school. Great. So literally literally from zero to 2,300 in the course of what, 18 months? Two and a half years. Two yeah. and a half years. Wow. So talk about scaling. Uh, that's pretty amazing. So let's, let's maybe Reese and then we'll finish with Craig. So tell us about your story. I know you, after MIT, you were in what, finance? Uh, so how did, how did you move into food from finance? It's a very interesting, very interesting story. Um, a friend of mine Can called me Can folks hear you? Maybe just a little closer with, with, the, with the mic. Great. Uh, a friend of mine called me up and asked me uh, to help him find healthy food for his four-year-old because he was struggling like so many parents waking up early in the morning to cook food every day. And when we, when we couldn't find another company doing it, or we had no solution, and the school had no solution, and other parents had no solution, that's when we decided to found Red Rabbit. Now, Red Rabbit went through a few iterations. That was the first founding. The second one happened about two years later. Learning, once they learned how pervasive this problem of healthy food in schools was, Red Rabbit really became a mission-based company, and that's when sustainability kind of wove itself into the, the fabric of the company. We, we raised the mission for providing from a convenience product for parents to really trying to change the food system in this country. And from that, we've grown over the last five years. Great. So roughly five-year-old enterprise then, at this point? Now, now we're seven years old, but I don't, I don't really count those first two years. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Pre, Pre-launch. Great. Craig, how about you? Sierra Watchers? I think I'm the, the tortoise of this group. Yeah, I don't know about The long that. run. You mentioned uh, Michael Pollan and Marion Nessel, and Michael is a dear friend and, and true mentor. I, I've been farming now for 35 years, and I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I did not have a farmer in my background. But I've learned so much from what Michael has written about, and it, uh, it, it truly is visionary. And it's taken us, you mentioned the farm bill, and we should call it the food bill. So many of us are now involved. We're eaters, and we're interested in, in agriculture. We're in, you're interested in what I'm doing on the farm today, and that's great. And one of the things I'd like to talk about during the course of this is how we're going to move forward together as a farmer, as an environmentalist, as consumers, as environmentalists who care tremendously about the stewardship, the sustainability. That's what you're here about in this program. How are we going to do it? So my route was a circuitous one, as you briefly mentioned. I came from Washington, D.C. out to California in 1969. What a turbulent time in our nation's history. It's a turbulent time in my own history. And after a year of college, I did the unthinkable. I dropped out. And as a dad today of a 27, 24, and 20-year-old, that would be a hard one to you know, manage. But that journey through Latin America, working on peasant farms, did what you also said about Mary and Nestle. Calories are political. Farming is political. Food is political. And as a, a uh, growing up in the 60s, as a person dedicated to the land, I found that farming brought politics and food together. And I have enjoyed it every step of the way for the last 33 years. Amazing. So, Craig, when did the center come around? Were you first the sort of the business entrepreneur creating? See our orchards, well, or yeah, and one the of the center came later as an educational and advocacy. Well, you piece. know, we all have our definitions of sustainability, and I like to think of it as the three P's. You know, doing what's right for the planet, for the people who are out in working on the farms, the farm workers and the farmers, and then the profit. And I've always said that as Sierra Orchards, I've got to be profitable. If I want to be here tonight, we have to be making a profit. So that that was first. 
um, family has always been very important. And during, when our children were young, we started bringing kids from urban areas out to the farm. And it was just that learning experience, that you know, connection with nature, addressing nature deficit disorder, and doing what you all do in terms of feeding people and children, um, that was the nexus of it. So that started about 17 years ago on our farm and has grown to be a statewide program. Tell folks quickly about the mission of the center and, and let's connect that up to this conversation. Well, it, the way to connect it today is, as you said, today was Ag Day. So we had Secretary Ross, we had Willie Brown from the great city of San Francisco coming up to talk about, uh, about the importance of agriculture. And feeding this next generation of, of decision makers is the most important thing we can do. And uh, one thing I want to mention is on April 3rd, we at the State Board of Food and Agriculture, I happen to be the president of this organization that is appointed by the governor, we're focusing on this California School Lunch Program. So we want you back in Sacramento on April 3rd to address this, this important issue of how we're gonna do it. I think we can, but we're not doing it today. This is with farmers, the folks growing the, the feedstock for your granola, the folks supplying uh, your kitchens as you're preparing the, the lunches. What's, what's that supply chain look like to you sort of as a business owner? I'll take this one first. Um, so about two years into the company's existence, once we made that commitment to sustainability, I really took an interest in where the food came from that we were, that we were cooking. Uh, and then and there's, there's one day in particular. So in New York, there, there was very little infrastructure for a small food service company or for any food service company to tap into the local farming industry. And there was no one to call, there was nowhere to go. There was no website that aggregated information for us. And so through connections, I found out that the wholesale green market had a very small parking lot that local farmers could drive down to a few days a week in their trucks and distribute their produce. So I headed out there and, and the market was open from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So at about 4 a.m. in the morning, headed out to this, this parking lot and met with a few of the farmers. And the first day I went out there was a blistery New York fall day sometime in November. And I met with one of the farmers and I spent about an hour out there talk, speaking with the farmers. And I came back with a few heads of broccoli and a few heads of cauliflower. And when, when we put that into the kitchen and the chef made a meal for me, it was the best broccoli I'd ever had. It almost felt as though I was, what I was eating before wasn't really broccoli. And, um, and, and that was that kind of aha moment where I, where I put it all together and said, this thing's really broken. Because there's no way for this broccoli to get into the schools. There's, because what I've been eating for the last 15 years in New York City is, is no comparison to what this is. And so that really started our mission to connect with the farmers in the region. Um, at some point, and perhaps it is about 80% of our produce comes from local farmers. We work with about 35 different vendors, all farmers and artisans, to source our ingredients. And it's really a passion of the company to get out there and touch where the food comes from. I'd love to see a farm prep. And, and, and really connect the dots from the food that we're putting on the plate in front of the kids to where it's grown and how it's grown and, and that whole process. That, that food miles travel from winters to, uh, to, to New York might be a little tough, but maybe we'll, we'll do the swab, you'll come out here. Reese, how, Red Rabbit, where'd that name come from? I wish I could take credit for it. It's the four-year-old that, that we started the company for. We all were sitting around coming up with names one day, and she just walked in and said Red Rabbit. To this day, we have no idea where she got it from, but we all agree that it was much better than anything else that we've come up with. <laughs> it's, very, it's very clever, it's excellent. Well, speaking of names, I mean, as Chief Love Officer of Love Grown Foods, what's your connection to the, to the land and to farms? I know you grew up in the Roaring Fork Valley, um, so it's, it's real. Um, how do you maintain it, and what's the company's connection? We know that knowing where your food comes from is so key. And unfortunately, being in Colorado, we're limited in terms of what we can get locally for our current line of products. However, we strive to know every manufacturer or every supplier that we're dealing with. Majority, I would say over 50% of the ingredients we source today are direct to the farmers, and we want to know where our food's coming from. We have high standards of who's supplying our food and are these ingredients that we want to be feeding ourselves on a daily basis, let alone the mass public. And so it really is so important to be able to source where your food's coming from to connect with those people. And it's something that we pride ourselves on. And Maddie, you guys 
I mean, right out of the gate, have established as part of your business model, as I understand it, an education program. Do you want to tell folks a little bit about that? Yeah, so and it wasn't as right out of the gate as I think um, sometimes when you start a business, your business starts you. And um, my mom was a special education teacher for 30 years, and she was reading in the 70s about how ADD and ADHD are inherent from foods that kids were eating as opposed to um, how, they're, how kids are being fueled. And so when Alex and I launched into getting this company off the ground and quit our jobs full time, we were in stores demoing three days a week for eight hours a day and we were watching what America shops and eats and puts in their cart and quickly realized that Roaring Fork Valley is very unique. And the Roaring Fork Valley, the mountains of Colorado, that's not the maxes. And so by watching and observing that, we realized that we had to be a part of the change and we wanted to get to the ground level. And so we've started a program where we have a three-prong approach and one's going to schools and actually volunteering in classrooms and providing nutrition education so that schools and teachers and students have access to what whole grains are and to knowing the basics behind nutrition because we're not providing our kids with those tools today and parents even aren't always provided with those tools today. So how can you educate kids to take that knowledge home and share that with their parents. We're also working with school districts to provide healthier options to their students. One of our accounts is the Berkeley Unified School District just over across the bridge. And um, they're providing their kids who are on free and reduced meals, healthier breakfasts. They're really huge advocates. They're one of the leading districts in our nation of changing how our students eat. And the third approach is working with community and doing things like this to share why this is such a prevalent issue and how the community can be involved and how they can become more aware of that. We have hunger issues and nutrition issues right here in our backyard. Yeah, let me just jump in on that one. Um, you really touched on the big issue in California. Um, we have 18 to 20 percent of our population that is food insecure, so they do not know where their next meal is coming from. That's seven million people in a state that provides 50% of the fresh fruits and vegetables for the nation, a tremendous export to the world with a fourth or fifth largest agricultural economy in the world. We cannot afford to have our population go food insecure. And it starts in school. And so I think we have a tremendous opportunity. There again, as a farmer and as a board uh, president, I've challenged our board and our farmers to increase our donations from 100 million pounds a year to 200 million pounds a year to food banks in California. Now people shouldn't really have, have to go to food banks to get their food. And what I'm trying to encourage us as eaters to look at is uh, as farms as uh, pharmacies and food as Rx. It really is. It's, when we're producing healthy food, there's nothing better that I can do. I, I am so proud to be a Californian farmer, and at some point I do want to get into organics versus sustainable versus conventional a little later in the conversation. Great. Risa, I know you want to jump in, but can you define for our audience what, what you say, 200 million? How many pounds? 200 million pounds a year. That sounds like a lot of nuts. Of food. Of food. I'm challenging, okay. we, we have challenged our other California uh, growers to contribute, so that's to, to increase from 100 million pounds of food a year to food banks to 200 million pounds. Gotcha. Great, so I just wanted to touch on what Maddie spoke about earlier too, and that's kind of the education component. Similar to her experience, um, early on when we started providing this uh, healthy, fresh cooked food in our schools, we realized there was a huge disconnect between, um, between the food we were serving and what the kids were understanding about the food that we were serving. So we had our chefs and our, our sourcing guys going to such great lengths to bring healthy food into the school, and then to see a, a teacher who didn't understand why we cooked the meal that way or a student not enjoy the food just because they've never seen it before and no one took the time to tell them, well, this is what this is, and give it a shot, and you might like it. It's a sweet potato. Um, you know, that was really disheartening. And so we started our education program, and that's kind of taking over the, the mission of the company. It's as important to us as providing the food, as educating kids, teachers, and parents about the food that they eat. And for the business school students in here, the MBA part of it, it was a great kind of connection for the business also. If we didn't teach the people, if we didn't teach the teachers and the kids why we were serving that food that way, they wouldn't eat it. They wouldn't want it. And so we had a situation here where we could do good by providing these nutrition, nutrition education courses and this education.
and also kind of support our business by encouraging people to eat healthy food, which we were providing. Craig, you've got now a few decades worth of perspective and experience as a farmer, as an advocate, as a leader in this country's and perhaps the world's leading agricultural producer. Reese, uh, a, a couple of generations removed, and Maddie, then one more. I mean, we have a really nice arc of experience and perspective about how the issue or issues of sustainable food and ag have arisen to such a, a scale, a level where I think it's fair to say that at Presidio Graduate School, what, a third, maybe half of our students, if they're not totally committed to creating a sustainable food or ag related business, are, are passionate about it nonetheless. It really is a top issue. It's one of the reasons uh, I reached out to Michael about an honorary degree. He captures the spirit of, well, many generations, but certainly this generation in the 20s and 30s. I'm looking at Ali Giorsi, who's in our audience, who runs a really cool organization called Savory Times, which produces amazing food for organizations in the arts and environment, among other things. Um, what do you think, starting with you, Craig, accounts for the rising sort of popularity of this issue, such that Bittman wrote that piece this morning? Um, what's been the shift or changes, and how has that affected you? something, uh, Maddie and, and Reese, that you guys paid attention to in the last, say, decade? Well, one of the things is, in this incredibly polarized and diff difficult climate that we find ourselves in, we've created as a, as, a, as a union, as a nation, as a society, we cannot let these differences of producers, of, in corporate, of corporations, of small farmers, of large and big, and organic and, and sustainable and conventional divide us. We cannot afford to do that. We're gaining a population of, what, 225,000 people a day, hurling ourselves towards 9 billion people. We can't afford to do that. We have so many mouths to feed, so much hunger to take care of in this state, in this nation, in this world, that we need to partner up. And we can't be environmentalists and agriculturalists. And one of the, I was talking with one of you earlier about uh, Roots of Change. Well, Roots of Change here in the city has done a remarkable job in working with us in agriculture to create a very large tent where everyone is welcome. You leave at the door the things that you can't agree upon and you come in and you try to establish what you can agree upon. And we developed something that I'd like you to download. If you just go on um, the site of the um, California Ag Vision, you can download a, a, a vision that we crafted over the last two years and I think you'll be proud of it. It comes up with 12 strategies the first of which is to provide a healthy, sustainable food supply for all Californians. Can't everybody agree with that? I think so. And it outlines how we get there, how we get there on water, how we get there on regulations. When you talk to a farmer, regulate, no farmer likes to be regulated, but it is the silver lining. It is what we can sell to you, to the world. We are the highest regulated industry in the world, in California, and we pay for it. You pay for it. We're paying billions of dollars for it. And we have multiple overlaps of, of regulation that I really do think we can streamline while maintaining our environmental integrity. So that's our take on sustainability. Got it. But I mean, was pollen the tipping point? I mean, who tipped the issue or what tipped the issue in the last, let's say, decade? You tipped the, the issue. Such that everybody's so you tipped good. the issue. We tipped the issue. Um, it, it was time. Uh, I'll take. I'll start on this one. So for me, you know, I studied computer science at MIT. Then I went into finance. Uh, very, very typical story. Typical ag story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Motivated to take care of the environment through my computer screen. Um, no, no. So, but but clearly, when I was in finance, and I enjoyed my time there, and I enjoyed working on Wall Street. But I saw just such wasted talent there. Not not wasted, but. You had, you had people who were so talented and so bright and then working for something that they weren't sure what they were working for. And that was kind of my motivation to do something that helped people and helped my environment and helped my community. And so when I got the opportunity to start Red Rabbit, I just jumped on it. And I think, I think during that period, there were a lot of us then that, that felt an emptiness, felt that at some, some point along the way, we lost our way and we knew we had talents and we could help the system and help um, help our country and our society, but we just didn't quite know how to do it. And on that point too, Bill, I recently watched uh, 
uh, the movie 21 Jump Street. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's, it's hilarious, but they had a really poignant scene in there where the, um, where the cops went back to high school and they were trying to categorize who was cool in high school. And the coolest group in high school were the kids that cared about the environment. And they had a scene where they looked at the cops and said, what, you don't care? You don't care about your environment? That's not cool, man. And, and I think that really speaks to what you're talking about. It really is an issue of today. It's, it's the young kids today care about it. It's a part of what they want to do. It's a part of how they see the world. And um, I think Michael Pollan had a big part in that. He definitely did for me. Uh, Super Size Me and, and the other documentaries that really opened my eyes to, to how deep this problem was and that we were really on an unsustainable path and that if, if we didn't do something about it, we, we didn't know where our future would, would take us. Great. And I'll just piggyback right off what Reese is saying. It's exactly true, and I think that there are some amazing documentaries that really put over the edge, including also Food, Inc., and I think the biggest issue that really opened our eyes as a nation was the fact that our kids are sick, and that is preventable. It's 100% preventable, and how do we, as parents, as community, as a nation, grasp that? And I think that seeing an issue that was plaguing our nation that can be avoided as the lead, one of the leading nations in the world and yet we're sick and our kids are dying before their parents. I think all of that touches home, too close to home. And we're a nation that's reactive. Unfortunately, we're not as proactive as maybe we should be. But I think recognizing that these issues are prevalent and they're affecting the people we love, they're affecting our families, that's when it really touched home. And I think that um, another great entrepreneur that I would love to bring up is Blake McCoskey, who started Tom's Shoes, because it puts in perspective that for-profit businesses can give a tremendous amount back to the world and to the community. And I think this whole surge of entrepreneurs, whether it's Michael Pollan or whether it's like people like Blake, it's really how do we change the way there's conscious consumerism out there? Great. I, I was just uh, thinking as you were talking to Maddie, and I was going back to soil. When, if you have a healthy soil, that is the beginning of all life. And you have microbes, and I'm so glad that Joey's here, because he's one of your classmates, and he's got this carrot cake, and he's ground up some worms, and he's got, what do you have in it? You've got uh, crickets. Crickets. Chapolin. Um, but my point simply is, these are not icky things. They come from the earth. They come from the soil. Um, the French talk about terroir, and it's true. I tried to convince my old dad before he passed on, there really is a difference in flavors, and it comes from the different types of soils. And I said, Dad, you love tomatoes. Said, I can't really tell the difference between an organic tomato and a conventional tomato. And I said, yes, you can. You taught me that when I was seven years old. Um, it's, it's, it's so important, and children today don't have that. They don't have that connectivity, and I think they're missing out on those delicious and nutritious nutrients in the soil. Well said. So well said. I see why and how you founded the center. By the way, Craig just won one of the most prestigious awards in the state through the Irvine Foundation as one of the great uh, civic leaders of the state uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, so, Craig, can I, just, can I just comment? Thank you. That if you look at what we in California are doing, what our brothers and sisters, it is so inspirational to be, I was so humbled to be part of Back to when that first day when I went and I met with the farmers and I had that amazing broccoli. So I was very green, excuse the pun, on the whole issue of farming. And so I asked the farmers if they were organic. And these were third generation farmers who had very rough hands when you shook them because they, they worked in the soil. And he came over and he just looked at me and he, he started laughing said, no, my family's been doing this for 100 years. I'm not going to pay to get a certification when we take care of the land already, because that's our livelihood. Um, Every time I jump in, I agree. But we often hear that the fee for certification is an onerous thing. It's not. I pay for everything. I mean, in this society today, what don't we pay for? I pay for, I have to register any products that I put into, any time that I buy seed, or a manure, compost, cover crop, you know, I, I pay fees, so that's the only thing I would differ on that point. Uh, but I, I think your 100 years of experience with the farmers is very legit. Well, I think what I really took out of that was understanding that there was a person, and so what Craig said also, there's a business, and they, they're balancing their kind of needs too. And um, once you can connect to that person, there's an understanding that this is, these are 
why we made these decisions and here's the quality of food we're providing for you and you can actually see that there's someone behind there then we're already 10 steps 10,000 steps ahead of where we were before great so let's let's touch on um, urban ag which has become uh, a very hot issue within the larger spectrum of, of ag and food issues food production issues um, in fact, one of our alum, Shivani Ganguly, with some friends, started a company called Window Farms. Uh, it's a sort of kit of parts to grow produce indoors in urban environments. Uh, I believe they're based in Manhattan currently. Um, and they're windowsill uh, uh, garden kits. Um, small scale production, you might say. We've heard a lot of, in the last 10 years or so about vertical farming, where green roofs are all the rage, have been since McDonough put them on the, the Gap headquarters here in the Bay Area. Um, fantasy or, or legit? And, and Craig, maybe you, you can speak to this. Um, I, I can't imagine it poses any real threat to more traditional uh, uh, land-based farming, but I seeing, think seeing more cities do it the contrary, in terms we, we need it. I had the experience um, with our last Secretary of Agriculture, Eiji Kawamura, to go to Havana, Cuba, and see what happened when their economy absolutely imploded and collapsed in 1990. I didn't really get it, how, how badly and how dire the situation was. And we went out to one community that was built by Russians. It was a large uh, apartment complex, probably housed 100,000 100, people. And in the middle of this was 11 hectare, what was a dump site. Well, when the economy imploded and there was no diesel, no sprays, no fertilizer, no seed, no tractor parts. They had to go organic. And they turned this 11 hectare acre into a Garden of Eden. Why can't we do that right here in San Francisco, in Sacramento? I, I live near Davis, which is on the best lands, you know, Mediterranean climate. You, don't, you can't get a, a, a better growing area in the world than the valley that we live in. And we've got infill spots, you know, five acres here, three acres there. It's a perfect way to do this. Back to Havana, that one site was employing 150 people full time. It was a cooperative. They had their farmers market stands, so they had their poultry animals and eggs and fresh broccoli, and it was bountiful. We're seeing such a rise now in cities and towns renewing and reviewing their land use regs. Land use codes to allow for chicken coops and allow for community gardens. It's a it's a it's a very popular movement among land use lawyers and advocates to change those rules so you can actually allow for by and, right. And, and let's not forget the pleasure, that, you know, what you all were referring to. That just the pleasure of that that broccoli and, and doing what you enjoy doing in your home. Enjoying the fruits of your labor. Enjoying the fruits of your labor. Literally. Hey, you know, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, it would be great if folks have questions. Why don't we begin to open up? We've got a, a mic here for, for public use. Um, if folks want to start lining up who have questions, we'd love to begin to entertain them as we uh, look at another 20 minutes or so. Um, I'd love to ask you a question about sort of models, role models and, and heroes in the in this space. Um, as you were thinking about your ventures, your enterprises, was there an individual or an institution, or for that matter, a business that you guys used as inspiration to sort of drive you forward as you built your business? I would love to start. I think that there's definitely some amazing entrepreneurs that I look up to. I mean, you mentioned Blake of Tom Shoes and Michael Pollan, and I think Gary Hirschberg is another leader in this industry of making this all happen. But I also have to give an immense amount of credit to my parents. And to any of you out there who are parents, these values start at home. And this knowledge starts at home. And so to have parents who made food with the seasons and who put dinner on the table and we sat down as a family, no TV, no phones, nothing, and communicated and talked about our day, that impacts how society eats. And that's going to impact our children more than anything. And I sit here in front of you as a example of that and I think they are the number one biggest motivation beca behind that and to know that we can do that and there, those are some simple changes we can make as a society and the impact it will have that's my greatest motivation. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Sarah Kaplan. I'm a Presidio Graduate School student and co-chair of the Sustainable Food Club. Speak up, speak up just a little bit. Thanks Sarah. Sorry. Yes um, and I wanted to speak more to the affordability issue because um, I think that's really, really important in shifting the way that Americans are able to feed themselves in this country. Um, and Maddie, I really appreciated that you brought up you know, the importance of demand for organic. Um, but 
in general, are there any particular ideas or innovations that you all can think of or that you would kind of put out there for ways to ensure that people can have access to affordable foods and and also so that young people with ideas on how to you know, create a more sustainable food system can enter that market and start businesses when it's not a profit-making venture and you know, if you're coming out with school debt or if you don't have a lot of capital to get started, how do you take that leap of faith to become an organic farmer, or become a sustainable food business entrepreneur? I'd love to hear your advice on that. Innovations and affordability. Uh, where are they and, and how do you take the leap in what could be a, an expensive and, and high risk proposition? Um, I think built into our business, when we made that, that shift and that commitment to provide healthy food for all kids, which was a pretty big distinction for us, um, we, we had a hard cap on what we could charge for the meals and that was set by the federal government. And Reese, can you tell folks where, where you are exactly in terms of what schools, what, what the school district is or what they are? When we started, we were pre predominantly in private schools, and that allowed us a little flexibility on the affordability issue. But once we kind of made that commitment to provide food for all kids, we entered into the public and charter school space. And so we had to figure out a way to get our healthy food into those schools at the same level of quality we did for the private schools, but at a much lower price point. So that, that kind of was a challenge for us, and a lot of people still today don't quite understand how we do it. That's our secret sauce. But I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a little bit of it today. One of the things that jumped out at us is, is our snacks, um, muffins and breads and so forth. And we make them all ourselves. So we start with flour, uh, before we flour, sugar, eggs, milk, usually some cinnamon or vanilla, and that's it. And when, when we did our analysis, and we are a business, and we are a for-profit business, we did our analysis on what's the best way for us to provide the highest quality healthy food for the kids at these very tight price points. It, it turned out that by cooking the food ourselves, we could provide it at a lower price point than if we bought a packaged product. So we're sitting in the room and we use an organic whole wheat flour and we use organic brown sugar and we're using organic milk and we're using eggs from a farm not far away and we're going, this muffin costs less than if we bought a prepackaged muffin that has 30 ingredients in it. How is that? How is that possible? Wow, that's really revolutionary. And so, <laughs> again, cooking is revolutionary these days. So my advice to young entrepreneurs in the food service business, cook, cook, cook the food. Understand how to cook the food. And that right there will drive down your cost. <laughs> Other than that, you're correct. I mean, I, I think it's such a valid point, and I think that affordability and accessibility are going to be some of the biggest hurdles we'll face as a country as we try to get healthier foods out there. And I will not sugarcoat it and say that we're making bank because we're not. We're um, losing money as we speak. However, we see the greater good, and we know that down the road, we intend to be profitable, hands down. And I love your piece because profitability has to be on there. Eat your piece. We, we, yeah, eat your piece. We have to, we want to be around in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And at the same time, we also want to make a difference. And to us, it was being able to cut back on the profit we would have access to, recognizing that there's a greater issue at hand here. And so it was, it's a hard, and I, I mean, capital, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for it, and it's um, a hard, it's part of just starting a company, but I think that we saw a bigger reason to not charge $6.99 a bag and to charge less, knowing that it goes towards a greater cost. And I would say it's, it starts at home and goes to Washington, D.C., in the sense that I typically do the shopping at the local store on Sundays. So I'll buy a meal for four, I'll buy dinners and breakfasts and lunches for the next four or five days. And I don't think I'm spending any outrageous amount of money because I'm doing what you said. I'm cooking at home with basic ingredients. And where it goes to Washington is in terms of policy. When we ultimately have a farm bill, a food bill that really prioritizes our health and well-being over, you know, some of the historic subsidies. Now, let me ask you one question here. In the um, farm bill, what percentage of it do you think goes to um, subsidies? Would it be 
those of you who think it's uh, above 50%, raise your hand. Okay, so a goodly amount. Um, the rest of you, would it be around 20%? Something? Okay. It actually, I think 75% of the farm bill goes into um, school nutrition and food. It's, it's a huge amount. It's a, I think it's a hundred billion dollar endeavor and the majority of it goes into the school lunch program, nutrition, excuse me, SNAP, food stamps, that sort of thing. We can do a lot with the 40 or so, 30 or 40 billion that goes into subsidies and I think we're, that will change. I think a little bit this, this farm bill, but certainly by the next one we'll, we'll see huge changes in there. So. And just Commenting with that, I think that's also educating your consumers because at the same time, $4.99 is not cheap. And to us, I always constantly am telling consumers if I'm face to face with them and they say, oh, it's so expensive, I say, you can pay for it now or you can pay for it later. And that's really, we have to have a reverse thinking amongst us as a nation of saying, we have to invest in our health. And you have a health bank and every time you eat healthy and you do active lifestyles and you're getting enough sleep, all of that fills your health bank with lots of wealth. Mm -hmm. Health is the greatest wealth. And so if we can also educate consumers on how maybe spending $4.99 versus $2.99 for something that's full of all sorts of bad sugars and hydrogenated oils and things like that, they're actually saving money in the long run. That's so great, Maddie. Do you, do you mind if I just let people know that you're only three years out of undergraduate college? Um, undergraduate. Undergraduate. So uh, a, a true leader in this field right out of the gate. Um, and saying what you said and, and with the passion and the business to back it up is, is really meaningful. So thank you. thank you for doing what you're doing. Next, next question. My name is Melissa Jacobs. I live in Oakland. Yes, you need to speak up just a little bit so folks can hear you in the back. <laughs> I live in Oakland. Uh, it has become um, a place of, of pure home to me. I, I absolutely love it. And I, I studied to become a math and science teacher. Um, however, I found out that my massage job that I got to get through college was actually a lot more sustainable, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Anyway, um, I have fallen in love with my community and the children in my community and trying to inform them on healthy living. However, um, when I'm working with kids in the school system and they're, they're eating healthy at school, I go back home and their parents tell them it's not reasonable. We are not going to eat that way at home. These people are filling their heads full of lies, whatever. So I, I totally agree with you. We need to bring it to the home. We need to educate the consumers who are the parents. And we need to figure out other ways of doing that, how to educate the parents. There's one thing, I mean, it's wonderful to bring it to the, to the school system. I'm sorry, I'm really terrified of public speaking. <laughs> But, um, but it's another thing to, to teach the parents. I live with a roommate who is going through gallbladder problems and whatnot. She does not believe me. I cook right in front of her. I show her my budget. I do everything I can. And she doesn't believe me that it's more affordable to go to Berkeley Bowl and get a bunch of produce than go to McDonald's down the street. I would love to first say that you should never undermine the power of younger people, especially our children. And I think that um, the Recycle movement was influenced so greatly by kids educating their parents. And kids have a huge influence on their parents. And I think that if we can really give kids tools, hands down, you're going to face families that won't ever break the mold. They will never go out of what they're doing currently. But at the same time, I also really believe and we've seen that kids go home and they share that knowledge with their parents. And for some kids in our world, in, in the United States, their parents never even had the opportunity to go to high school or go to college and so they rely on their kids to give them a form of education. So I think that the more we can empower kids with these tools, the more they can really share that. We will be part of a group of five this year, but and they all were San Franciscans, um, so check them out, what they're doing and what you all are doing is quite remarkable. Farm to uh, 
uh, uh, commissary to marketplace. I want to ask each of you to think about the sort of the hottest, most compelling areas within each of your verticals within the supply chain. Because what we have in the audience are many who really are or want to start businesses. You mentioned Joey and his edible insects uh, as a great source of protein. No sooner had Joey talked to us about that than Nathan Jones from upstairs came back as he heard that folks were going to be around. Is Nathan back in the room? Nathan is part of Ag Local, which wants to source uh, meat locally uh, for a healthier food supply. And I've heard of Reese, and Reese, you just heard about Nathan today or yesterday. Um, and that's part of what the Hub does, it's part of what Presidio does, right? We connect people, social capital leading to innovation and in enterprise. So, what we've got in the room tonight are folks who are starting or want to start businesses like yours, uh, complementary in this ecosystem. If you can name sort of the one or two hot areas in, in each of your respective uh, business areas, that would be great. Reese in getting healthy food in the schools. Maddie, what's next after granola? Uh, Craig, farming. Uh, where's, where's the new value add in, in farming? Why don't we start with Reese with you? Sure, absolutely. So when I, when I got into kind of sustainability and the company started focusing on that five years ago, there was no infrastructure. There's no one to go to. And there's a discernible difference today. Nathan from Ag Local is one of the entrepreneurs leading that way. Um, we're trying to connect local farms and connect the source of the food with either consumers or with companies like mine that will cook the food and food service companies. And so I'm really excited to speak to Nathan about Ag Local. There's a, another great company called Real Time Farms, which connects you to the farmers where your food comes from. Um, there's another one that just started in New York too. The name's escaping me. But that's a very, very hot area, kind of. How do we get distribution of the food from the farm to the food service company or to the consumer? Because five years ago, it didn't exist. It was dominated by a few large distribution companies. So are you competing, if you will, with Revolution Foods, for example? Is that that's sort of a, a West Coast, East Coast. West Coast competitor? Because uh, they, they come out of the Bay Area, as, as I know them. Yeah, they do. Um, but now they're... They're scaling. Yeah. Um, so you guys sort of head to head? We are, we are head to head. They actually just entered into my backyard in New York. So, but um, they've been trailblazers. The they've been trailblazers in the industry and they really are across the country trying to change how food is served in schools. I heard their first pitch or one of their first pitches back in 2007 at the investor circle meeting here in San Francisco. This was the, the two women, uh, their their business plan at, at the Haas School of Business, which is, uh, I think it's in a different state, it's over in Nevada somewhere, but uh, have grown uh, such a, an amazing business. Um, do you see yourself competing also with Cisco and, and the other big food service providers? Or Sodexo, where do they fit into your orbit? To some, some extent, we do compete with them, but I don't think they're really, really our competition. I think if they don't make changes to how they provide food, their, their processes, that they're headed, um, they're going to become dinosaurs pretty soon. On, on, on another level, they are in control of the distribution systems, and companies like Ag Local that are finding a new way to distribute food, I think is really, really their competition. And again, if, if they don't find a way to change how they do business, because they haven't done a good job over the last 30 years, then I think in short order, um, they may not be around very long. So, so room for more distribution innovators, uh, if not uh, cook and, and uh, commissary. It's, it's, it's interesting that we call cooking innovating. Something <laughs> exactly. exactly. But it, it, it definitely took a turn in the wrong direction sometime in the last century. So yeah, cooking food is innovating today. <laughs> Maddie, what about you? So where, what, what's, uh, what's the direction for your company? Because it, it sounds like you are expanding the product line. But where do you see the next great opportunity for these guys uh, outside of, say, granola? Well, I think that in general, conscious consumerism having, there's a lot. I mean, we're up against the General Mills and the Kellogg's and the Post of the world. and to recognize that their resources are phenomenally greater than our small resources. How do you get people enthralled about what you're doing and excited to support you? And even 
if you're price competitive with those big companies, they say, Love Grown Foods is doing something great and I want to support them. How do you create a company that people want to get behind? Because people do, and that's the coolest and greatest reward, I think, of being an entrepreneur is that people want to support you and people want to support great things because they feel a part of it too. The biggest thing that I would push is affordability because at the end of the day, majority of us sitting in this room can afford to shop at higher end grocery retailers and buy more clean foods, if you will. However, I think that majority of the population in our nation doesn't have that luxury. And so our goal as a natural food company competing with these huge companies out there is to compete with them not just in distribution but in price. Because at the end of the day, the reason that people are going to be able to walk into their local Kroger or their local Safeway or their local Walmart and find clean products that are healthy and good is because they're affordable, not because they're at $10.99 items. Great. Affordability. Great. Well spoken. Um, I think for me it's the next generation of, of farm farmers. I touched upon it briefly, but Secretary Vilsack, Tom Vilsack, said we need 100,000 new farmers. And uh, we really are going to have to uh, climb that ladder quickly. I don't know if I mentioned the initiative that we just rolled out. Did I mention that already in February? Um, at the Center for Land-Based Learning. No, so, tell, tell us that. Yeah, okay. We started something called the California Farm Academy, which has um, been a vision of ours to help train the next generation of farmers. And they could be many of you in the room. They could be people getting out of their college experience, pre to college or post, it may be in your 50s. So our first crop of 20 beginning farmers range from 26 years old to 56. And it's extremely exciting because they're gonna be new farmers, brand new. They're gonna be servicing the food system in a really unique way, fitting your niches in a way that, that we haven't been. So that, for me, is, is the new vision. And I, I'm going to need your help um, in doing that because they're going to have to come up with farm plans and strategic planning. They're going to need investment. We're going to need to partner them with, with this aging population, making those farm connections so that, you know, when people like myself phase out of the farm, why can't we get a beginning farmer in there? And why can't there be a mentoring program na nationwide to do that? Wouldn't that be the best partnering on both ends of the, of, the, of the equation, it would be wonderful. I know when we take our high school program out to farms and ranches across California, who do you think has the most fun? Well, there's, there's high school students are, are in the dirt, they're putting in irrigation systems, but to look at the farmers, to have a crop of 30 high school kids as unique and, and diverse as this world is, you know, 70% of our, 67% of our kids come, are kids of color. So to get them on farms across California, mostly farmed by white men, it's a unique experience. And who gains? Everybody gains. So I think next gen is wow. my focus. That sounds awesome. Two, two uh, points. Next week at our school, we'll have a wonderful funder named Tom Willits from the Lydia B. Stokes Foundation. And I'd love to connect you to him, Craig. Would enjoy that. Uh, he was an early funder of Slow Food. And, and new ways of investing in, capitalizing new food ventures. He's supporting our school in, in our curriculum uh, review and, and innovation. Um, and we are thinking about a vertical in impact investing and, and agriculture, so we'd love to have you as part of that. Um, how do you select your academy students? Uh, where do they come from? Well, just like you, we want our academy graduates to be successful. So we, in our uh, application asked for a year's worth of, of demonstrated experience in the area of agriculture. So you didn't have to be farming per se, but we wanted to see that you develop a, a core principle and interest in this. So there are many people that want to farm, and as we've said, and you know, it's really, really complex, and you're up against a lot of issues, the obvious ones of climate and market, but we want success, so we looked for that first and demonstrations of that. We had about uh, for the 20 slots, I think we had almost double the number of applicants. So we hopefully, this is a six month in-class hands-on program and we'll run two of those a year. And those graduates, those who graduate and would like to, then can go on to an incubator farm. We're providing land on our farm so that if you are wanting to grow vegetables and you want to do some fruit trees and things of that nature, you can do it hands-on. You can try your drip irrigation, your market garden, CSA, 
well, somewhat controversial, challenging subject of definitions, organic, natural, local. Why don't we sort of get into that a little bit? I also then, I want to come back to the matter of urban ag and the innovations in urban ag versus sort of more traditional countryside or, or rural farming. Uh, but let's start, let's talk about organic and, and natural and local. Now I know Maddie, you, you're a natural food company. Reese, I don't know where you are on your sourcing and what your standards are, uh, NOFA or otherwise. Craig, you're thinking as a farmer, where do we stand in the debate uh, now, what, uh, 15 years out from the passage of the Federal Organic Act? I'd love to hear from these guys first and work back to the farm, Great. because it's so important what you're on the front lines. Reese, when you're sourcing, what, what are you looking for? Does it have to be organic, or, or are you a local versus or over-organic over guy? Over-organic. Um, that, that's interesting, and it is a hot debate. It's something that we internally inside the company debate religiously. Uh, I think in, in understanding the system, and one of the things that we kind of can all agree on inside of Red Rabbit and that we communicate, is that we want to serve our kids whole foods, real foods. You know? And we usually go back and forth on, on whether that should be an organic item or not. But the real focus for us, the one thing we won't compromise on, is that it's an actual whole food. So we want to know what the ingredients are. Can we see them? Can we touch them? Do we know where they came from? Do we, can we connect them back to the ground? Um, and we want to avoid any processing or additives or chemicals. And I'm a scientist, and we want none of that involved in kind of the food production aspect. Uh, when it comes to organic and local, we try and do as much many local use as many local farms as we can. And that, that really, in addition to the actual food, that has to do with kind of supporting our local community. We see ourselves as change agents within our community. And so supporting local farmers extends well beyond um, just getting a high quality food product. Those farmers then create new jobs for, for the community. Uh, the food doesn't have to travel very far. Um, so that has an environmental impact. And, and usually also, because we can go to the farm, it's easier for us to, to um, do our due diligence on the practices of the farmer because they're within driving distance. Whereas if something was international or so, we'd have to kind of rely on someone else to, to give us that information. Great. I, I completely agree with the debate over it and it tears us internally at the company apart to make have to make that decision. And going back to the affordability point, that's something that we weighed over organic and hopefully in the next few years that changes. And the way that changes is through demand and through us as consumers driving that cost down, saying we want organic and we want it to be affordable and we want to have it accessible. And so for us, we're not a certified organic product. We take so much pride in where we get our ingredients, where they're coming from, that relationship directly with the supplier and making sure that we know where what's in our food. And, being able to pronounce every ingredient is hands down the most important thing to us. We want you, we want kids to be able to visualize what every single ingredient is in their pantry at home, not in some science lab. And so it's a debate that we continuously go over and I think that one day I hope that Love Room Foods is a certified organic product and still a 4 99 price point. Great. Craig. I really appreciate your responses. I think they're exactly spot on where we need to be. I'm going to put a little plug in here for my nephew, who's a, a documentary filmmaker in LA. He just uh, premiered in the Roxy, um, In Organics We Trust. Have a look at it. It's kind of a national survey of what you think is organic. And what is it? Is it a certified program? Are you really getting what you think you're getting? I'm an organic grower. I did that. I came out of UC Davis with all the conventional tools. I hit the ground, and it wasn't a learning curve, it was a mine shaft. And I, at, at the top was survival, at the bottom was failure. And I put those tools to use that I learned, use, uh, to, that I learned to use, and it took me about 10 years to cycle towards an organic production. I did that because my wife would come home and she'd say, what is that smell in the orchard? And we'd be having our children there, and we were living in an area that we were spraying. And it just didn't make sense. And it also was an older orchard that, quite honestly, using the herbicides, the synthetic fertilizers we were using, really was creating poor health in the soil. 
In addition, in walnuts, you get paid by the actual size of the nut. So a larger nut gets five cents more a pound. And being an older orchard, we were losing money. Back to that P, the profit. So for those environmental, sustainable, and profitable reasons, I switched to organic. And it has been a true pleasure. And you do find nature's cycles, and you can really work with nature. And we've been very fortunate in the crop that we grow um, to work with nature in that way. And people will ask me, well, don't you get a little less uh, tonnage that way? And isn't the quality a little inferior? And I say, no, no, I'm a business person. I'm using the highest and best technologies to produce this crop today. That's why I need you as researchers. We need you to be producing the next wave that's going to control coddling moth or to provide the best uh, fertigation principles that we can and delivery systems. But um, so that's, that, that's my take. I, my view is that organic is an important piece of a much larger complex fabric of sustainable agriculture. Operating a sort of but a rebound effect on the parents of the kids. Uh, I imagine because you've gotten a lot of publicity, um, you have been out there. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of support and awareness. Um, have, you, have you engaged with that constituency, the, the parents of the kids that you're now feeding this great food? Thank you for that great comment. Um, we, we actually have. We've seen a lot. If you, if you have a system where the kids are saying, Mom and Dad, I want to eat healthy, you guys are, you guys are halfway to Nirvana. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, you know, it, it is tough. And sometimes parents will give a little bit of pushback. But we've been working with some families now for four, five, six years. And we'll, we'll regularly get phone calls from parents saying, my son or my daughter, had spinach and they want me to cook spinach. I've never bought spinach before in my life. Can you guys please give me a recipe on how to cook it? Um, and you know, it doesn't happen the first year, it might not happen the second year, but we're starting to see that start to roll into our business and it's a regular part of it. So while we have education outreach for parents and we try and give them the information too, I agree completely with Maddie here. If you can win over the kids, we're heading in the right direction. Thanks. Nice. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so I also have a business idea that I, I think might also help with this situation. I'm sorry, I didn't really ask you a question before, I just kind of stated my opinion. But um, I, I would love to talk to you some more. Um, no, Alyssa, why don't you, can you check with these guys after? Yeah. They'll be here for a yes. quick, quick check in. I'm sorry. Great, no worries. <laughs> we'll, we'll let Joey come up, but they'll be here. Thanks. Joey. Thank you all for being here. This was a, a great discussion. And uh, I'm Joey Christian, I'm a graduate school student. And I'm trying to bring a, a disruptive product to market. And I just want to hear from Maddie and Reese how you guys finance your businesses. Like, how did you finance it? I'll start because I definitely don't have the background that Reese does in uh, financing <laughs> that, that area. We launched, when we launched the company, Alex and I made everything ourselves. And back to Reese's original point. If you do it that way, you're going to do it the cheapest because you're not paying yourself. That's great. Um, <laughs> for the first year and a half, we didn't have a job. And we were lucky enough to have the support from my parents to have a place to live. And um, using, don't be afraid to go back home. <laughs> Maybe that's not the point. But we have since um, taken capital from angel investors. We're currently raising capital again, so you never have enough money is all, something I'll tell you, which I'm sure you can imagine. But the angel investor community, I think, is out there. And especially with an innovative idea, there's people who want to support you and who want to get behind you. And having a little bit of a run rate of saying, this is what we've accomplished and this is what we've done. We've just, excuse me, this is what we've accomplished. This is what, where we are. This is what we've done support us, I think, says a lot, as opposed to just saying, I want to start this business, I need some money. Prove it, and prove that you have a concept that's going to go somewhere, and prove that you're willing to roll up your sleeves, work ridiculous hours of the day, and dive in deep, knowing that something's coming of it, and then they say, okay, we'll invest. So that would be my greatest piece of advice. I would be thrilled to talk to you more about it. It's um, definitely been a whirlwind of a tour on that side. Maddie, would you feel comfortable giving them a sense of the, the scale of how much you've raised so far, and also mention some of your props, the, 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 the love butts, um, as it were, <laughs> as, as evidence of your passion and commitment to the business. So about um, one and a half years into the company, at that point we were 
in 120 stores just in Colorado. Um, we grew very untraditionally in the sense that our first store was City Market in Aspen, Colorado, and um, we launched six months later into 80 consumers and city markets throughout Colorado, which is a Kroger subsidiary. And to deal with Kroger over Whole Foods or an independent natural grocer type situation is totally different. And within a year of being in 80 King Supers and City Markets, we had the opportunity to launch into 1,300 Kroger's across the country. And that is a big number to swallow and even more imaginable how much granola that was. It was a lot. And with that, we knew to m meet that delivery date, we need, we, there was no way. Up to that point, we had financed it up, except for a loan from my parents to get an oven. And um, we raised just under half a million dollars from an angel investor, and then here we are a year, uh, just over a year, almost a year and a half later, and we're raising just close to a million dollars. So it's not a cheap venture. We pay ourselves close to nothing. We are the lowest paid employees of our company, and that's how it should be. And I think that um, it's definitely, you'll, and we plan on doing a future raise in the near future, so we're constantly raising money. And a great and a great bus to go with it. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. And so then, with the launch of Kroger, we bought LB the Love Bus, which LB LB stands for LB. Um, we so we could tour the nation and support the 1,300 stores, and we also have Sweet Pea the Love Prius that matches LB. They're very cute. But we really, um, with that and with the second raise, I'll just chime in one more point. Is we just recently assembled a board of advisors, and we have Mo Siegel who founded Celestial Seasonings Tea. And we also have Tom Spear, who was the original COO and CFO of Bare Naked. And to have two incredible individuals in our space, one who is a veteran who started this industry and was one of those per first pioneers, and then another who knows our category so, with such great knowledge, also gives huge confidence in investors. So surround your people, your team, your resources with incredible people and resources will come to you. I could talk about this ad nauseum. <laughs> and I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit later about it. When I, when I speak to entrepreneurs, especially young ones, it's one of the first questions they ask, how do you get financing? And I'm gonna mirror some of the things Maddie said. You know, Red Rabbit was self-financed for a lot of years before we raised venture capital. And it was a, a, a huge learning curve to understand that, that that's kind of what it takes. You know, rolling up your sleeves and putting in the time until you have a track record where you could show people, you know, not only am I committed to this, but there's a, there's a market for it and people and that really is proof to not only to the investors, but also to, to yourself, to myself as a business owner. And one other quick tidbit, it, it's just a part of your role as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, finding financing, cultivating financing sources. It, it's not a hurdle that you're going through now. It, it's gonna constantly just be one of the skills you're gonna have to develop and put in your pocket and throughout the life of your business. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll always be kind of in those conversations with banks, VCs, and, and so on and so forth. I, I lived under debt for uh, 25 years, and got, we finally got out of debt when we sold a conservation easement on our property. So that means that our land will forever be farmland. It will never be developed. And that was a choice we made, and we got paid for doing that. That got us out of debt. That's great. Nice. Why don't we take one more? Uh, Cindy, do you want to go up? Or um, Annie, do we have time for one more? Okay, let, let's, do, let's do one more. Great. I'm the elder, so I will let the cut go. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody. This is, uh, I really appreciate hearing your story. Um, my name's Misha Lee. I'm from Northridge, Rocky Falls here in San Francisco. Great. Can you speak a little yes. closer to the mic? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm Misha Lee from Northridge, Rocky Falls here in San Francisco. And we're starting a, a community garden. And I really emphasize the unity because that's what it's about. It's the unity um, with our neighbors. And one of the things that um, we're recognizing is that to create food justice, you really have to have economic development as part of it. And we have so many young people in the 18 to 30 year range that won't work. We could pay them full time. We could have a really flourishing garden, but we are scraping by with grants, and it's really, really hard. So I'm wondering, is there any kind of effort 
um, within the business community to also really support on a federal and state level a solid green jobs program to get these young people that don't want to be dealing uh, drugs and would really like to be doing urban agriculture, but there's no funding for, uh, you know, for employment, for, for survival. Uh, program, Craig, or that others are aware of that connect up economic development to, to ag jobs that you're aware of? You know, I'll have to get back to you. I think it's a really vital question. We, we have something called Green Corps that we work with during the summertime, getting 17 to 23 year old students, young people, jobs, and um, we do get some federal funding for that. So I'll, I'll give you a, a, a website and we can work on that. And just to, to encourage you a little bit, so we are moving through New York, New Jersey, and, and recently we went up to Massachusetts. And in all of our conversations with, uh, with the state, with the state administrators there, they're all really concerned about whether or not we, we can provide jobs. And they, they seem to be really excited about supporting any initiatives. So I'm not sure how it works here, but I'm sure if you keep pushing, there's, there's stuff out there for you. Great. Well, so many opportunities and challenges ahead, but uh, what a wonderful way to explore and expose our community to sort of the cutting edge of, of the, uh, the field and the industry. I want to thank uh, Reese and Maddie and Craig and all of you guys for coming out tonight on a Wednesday night midweek. Uh, what a wonderful panel you guys are and were and uh, can't wait to stay in touch with, with all of you. Thank you so much.